Okay, this is the podcast for AP Biology, Chapter 6, which is the end of Unit 2. First thing we're going to talk about is why energy is needed for an organism. Organisms use energy for different things. Um, for example, to build structure, to build muscle, to build, to get bigger, to grow. Um, also to carry out ongoing functions on a daily basis, like transcription in your cells, movement, to secrete, and also to, you need energy to reproduce. Um, there are two types of energy, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is stored energy, so it's the energy of position, as in this picture. Kinetic energy is the energy of action or motion. Okay. Um, when the archer is releasing the arrow, potential energy that is stored in the bow drives the arrow forward with the pulse of the kinetic energy. Um, some of the energy is lost as heat. Um, and then cells will store this potential energy as chemical energy in the form of ATP, and they will use kinetic energy as chemical energy in the form of ATP. Okay? There are two types of reactions you need to know the difference between, endergonic versus exogonic. Reactions that require energy input are called endergonic. If they need heat, they have the description of being endothermic. The opposite one is if the reaction releases energy, it is exergonic. And if the energy is released as heat, it is called exothermic. So it's a play on prefixes and suffixes. All right, let's watch this. The total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. It can change from one form or state to another, but it can never be lost and no new energy can be made. However, when energy is converted from one form to another, some is converted into heat and becomes unavailable to do work. This is why all living organisms require a constant energy input and why we need to eat every day. The flow of energy within an organism consists of millions of precisely regulated chemical reactions inside the cells. During these chemical reactions, complex molecules are broken down into simpler molecules. Or simple ones are built up into more complex molecules. Every reaction involves a transfer of energy between molecules. Reactions that release energy by breaking down chemical bonds are called exergonic reactions or, or energy out. And those that consume energy by building chemical bonds are called endergonic reactions, or energy in. Exergonic reactions are happening in the bodies of these basketball players. Chemical reactions are going on in their muscle cells, which release the energy that contracts their muscles and propels them. The heat that their bodies give off is another form of energy and a byproduct of those reactions. Endergonic reactions put molecules together to build muscles, bones, and other cells. The growing process is an obvious example. Cells also constantly need energy to repair damage and reproduce. These are endergonic processes. These types of reactions require an input of energy. Exergonic reactions release energy, and endergonic reactions consume energy. The two are part of a coordinated energy flow in which the energy released during one reaction helps to fuel the opposite reaction. Okay. Um, free energy. Free energy is the energy that's available for a cell, for example, to perform work. It's what metabolism is all about. Um, the ultimate source of energy on Earth is the sun. All right, so let's learn about what ATP is, because ATP is the currency of energy in the cells. ATP, you need to know what it stands for. Adenosine, T is triphosphate. Adenosine is um, another name for adenine, which is a nitrogen compound. looks like this. And then you have a sugar molecule, five-carbon sugar. And then it's attached to three tri, three phosphate groups, one, two, three. These yellow bonds here are representing high energy bonds. So during a hydrolysis reaction, this bond will break right here. The inorganic phosphate group will come off, 
and energy will be released in the cell. Um, ATP is a nucleotide. The three parts, again, are nitrogen base, which is called adenine, a 5-carbon sugar called ribose, and then you have your three phosphate groups where the energy is in those bonds. Hydrolysis, adding water, will break the bonds of ATP, releasing energy for the cell. As a result, we, are, we end up with adenosine diphosphate, meaning only two phosphates now instead of three, and an inorganic phosphate is released as well. That process is called phosphorylation. The role of ATP. ATP is the common currency of energy in the cell. It provides energy because those phosphate bonds are very unstable. Um, the phosphate bonds are sometimes called high energy bonds. Um, that last terminal phosphate can be added to a reactant and used in the body. Um, that process of removing that last phosphate is called phosphorylation. It's releasing ATP energy in the cell and ATP is broken down into ADP and an inorganic phosphate. Um, energy is released by the hydrolysis of ATP. So as you can see, it's a cycle. ATP can be changed and broken down to ADP plus inorganic phosphate, and then ADP plus inorganic phosphate with releasing energy will be making ATP. Another type of molecule that holds high energy bonds are, is called NAD plus, or big long word here, which you don't need to know, but I wanted to show you what it meant. Um, and if you add a, uh, what are you adding, two electrons and a proton, you get NADH. And NADH, that bond that's holding that hydrogen to this big molecule, is a high energy bond. It's another example we will be learning more about in chapter 7 and 8. Here is NAD+. Plus. You add a hydrogen and two electrons. You're reducing that molecule. And now we have NADH, which is a high energy molecule. Another one is FAD and FADH2. FAD, which stands for right here, can lead to the formation of FADH2, which is a high energy, low stability bond. And again, it's adding protons and electrons to get that high energy. So these reactions that we're talking about are called oxidation and reduction. Reduction is the adding of electrons. Oxidation is the loss of an electron. So for reduction, it re in results in increased energy. It's very common in metabolism. So NAD plus would be reduced to NADH. FAD would be reduced to FADH2. And then oxidation is the opposite. It's a loss of the electrons. So NAD can be broken down to NAD plus, and FADH2 can be broken down to FAD. Um, oxidation and reduction go hand in hand, and they're coupled together. When that happens, that is called redox. R-E-D for the reduction part. OX is for the oxidation part. And that's where we're going to stop the podcast for Chapter 6, Part 1. Go ahead and watch the podcast for Chapter 6, Part 2.